Welcome to the third of uh, this series of five conversations, and I'm really delighted to introduce uh, to you Thomas Demand um, and introduce him to the SciArc uh, uh, ethos, let's say. So for many, Thomas is really one of the most important artists of our time. The standard way, one of the standard ways to enumerate that would be to list the exhibitions that he, the solo exhibitions he's had and the, the institutions uh, by which he's collected uh, throughout the world, the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, the Tate, the Fondation Cartier, the Museum of Modern Art Tokyo, Fondazione Prada, the Boymans in Rotterdam, the Kunsthaus in Bregenz, I mean the list is really infinite. Um, Certain activities, uh, uh, more specifically, and institutional affiliations, attest not only to his stature in general, but begin to explain why I thought it would be interesting to ask him here, to SciArc in particular. So he exhibited at the Architecture Biennale, the recent one, Common Ground. He has been associated with the Canadian Center for Architecture. He did a project that started at the Getty Research Institute on Lautner that will, sort of on Lautner, uh, for which Lautner was a kind of alibi that we'll discuss a little bit this evening. The Graham Foundation in Chicago where he just opened a show, which is an institution, as you all know, with particularly strong ties to architecture. So um, one of the attributes of SciArc is the way it hosts a certain kind of conversation about architecture, and I would, argue that the full cadence of contemporary, this contemporary conversation can't really be heard without having Thomas's voice in the mix. Now, he is often referred to as a photographer, which is a term that always makes me think of Rosalind Krauss's essay on the expanded field, not because he's particularly working on the expanded field, but because of the way she argues that the use of old historical terms to describe new work has a kind of drag to them. So the desire to call him a photographer is to mistake a, um, the medium and the message, let's say, and uh, makes it difficult for us to understand the degree to which he uses photography to move between mediums and genres and, and, and issues and so forth. And it is precisely in this movement between works um, that his uh, project as a whole um, has the most to say to architecture. Architecture is often his subject. Architecture functions uh, globally as a system in ways that infiltrate uh, his work. And architecture as a procedure is something that is also very important uh, to the way he works. I was re somebody was recently telling me that you've had students from SciArc in your studio. So there is a specific form of cross-contamination uh, there. So I hope that what we'll do this evening is to try to discuss how two things can get so close that they look alike, um, that they can pass fluids and ideas and so forth together, and yet remain in some way irreducibly uh, distinct. So with, that's why you're here, um, to, to cozy up and get intimate and then um, go off and, and remain separate. So with that, if you can come up and join me, we'll just uh, start in on our conversation. Welcome, Thomas. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to look at this and they're going to look at that. Is this, this all right? I was told that I don't speak into the microphone enough, but here we go. Um, so I have a, some questions just to get us going that I've set up in relation to the order of your images. So uh, before we got started um, this evening, I had asked Thomas, did he want to present or should we just have a conversation? And he said, well, I more or less, he said, I'd like to see you give a presentation without being allowed to speak, <laughs> um, uh, which is what he thought of the idea of having a conversation without images. I thought you should know that that was part of the setup. I thought that was very well put. Um, so Black Label, which uh, as you can see here, um, was a project from 2008. And I was, I'm wondering whether you could show the images that you put together, um, but use it to describe, if you would, in particular, how your process unfolds. Like, in other words, what is the same about how you work in this project that we can extrapolate to how you work with projects in general? So um, 
I kind of assumed that you would roughly know how I'm working. So okay, we can skip that, I thought. So Me? What, I'm, what I got basically uh, chose is um, four projects which we kind of walk through quickly because they are many pictures, many more than I thought. But, you know, you just, it's kind of, you take it as a, as a travel through, um, you know, like a box full of stuff. And only a few of these things might, might mean something to you. But um, here I came to Japan to, you know, like, to, of course everybody loves Tokyo, Japan very interesting. But I spent a month in a, in a, sub, in a small city, uh, an industrial city on Kitakyushu, which is the main island, a big island there. Um, and uh, was like a teacher and also like an artist in residence. And I tried to kind of do something with the situation in, in, in Japan, which is not the Hello Kitty Tokyo kind of idea we have. And therefore nobody speaks English there really. And it's kind of you lost in the way you lost in, a, in not in translation, but you lost in a cityscape which you don't understand, thoroughly don't understand. And you can't, don't, can't even ask someone. And so I was looking around and trying to find a way of like getting a grasp on things. And, I realized that um, it's very hard. All the ideas I brought with me were invalid. And I, but I stumbled into this building here, which seemed to be kind of misplaced because it was in the middle of a parking lot. Um, but then the parking lot became a street. And I just kind of, I couldn't see the context of the building, but I saw that it has a certain, a certain shape, which is not random. So it's not a square or something. It's just, it had this kind of weird layout as you see it here. And it's kind of incredibly tiny. So I asked my hosts, um, whether should they know the place, of course they don't know the place, it's a hundred yards away from the station, from the fast train station. And I just, at some point, I just, you know, nobody wanted to help me, they thought it's kind of a shady mafia kind of Yakuza place or something. And so, so one evening I went in on my own and it turns out to be um, with two friends and it turns out to be a very tiny, tiny, tiny bar um, where it's so tiny that if you want a beer, the fridge is full of other things, so she kind of walks out that door you see, runs around the building, goes into the other door, get, takes the fridge out, uh, the, the beer out of the fridge you're standing in front of, runs away around the outside the building, and gives you the beer across the counter. At the same time, you see that it's kind of full of stuff there, and it's kind of a really weird, but very funny, very intimate place. And I thought it would be really funny. To, I mean, not it would be kind of interesting to work with that because it's so awkward and it, it's so such a kind of. Um, it's the density of it is kind of enigmatic and seemed to be, you know, a good metaphor for what I saw and what did, I didn't understand. At the same time, the building seemed to be really cheap and really, really cheaply put together. I did a little bit of research. It turns out that the building, um, which I made a model later on, which you look at now, right now, um, the building itself has been is already a replica of a building which was standing uh, 260 yards away. Uh, had to make space for a shopping mall, and then um, the, you know the, they were the only ones who didn't want to move, and so the city bought them out and guaranteed them to to re-erect the house in exactly the same shape with exactly the same features, just a little bit further down on a parking lot. At the time when I went there, it was nearly 10 years over, and that parking lot became a street leading to the fast train station, and they had to move again. The city kind of offered him the same deal again, so you move another 100 meters, we take this building down, we build another building exactly the same. Um, so in a sense, you're just, you're standing at, a, at the shape and everything is kind of coincidental, but it becomes this kind of running joke as a building in a sense. And I found this quite interesting. I wanted to use the bars as long as what's there and do something with it. <clears throat> and um, so I came home to Berlin because I, you know, the, I, I, could, I couldn't do any, any real work there. And I rebuilt the studio, in, the, in my studio I rebuilt the house nearly the, as big as I, I mean, as big as I could fit it in my studio, which is relatively large. It's bigger than this place. And I tried to kind of rebuild it and then photograph it um, um, and send the photographs back in a sense. And at the same time I also had a, had a project space to work with, to do a show in. See, these are details of the, of the building. So what I'm doing is basically I, out of cardboard, and other ephemeral materials, but you know, tracing paper and stuff. I'm building a mock-up, which looks like in these photographs looks like a model, but basically, it is um, still relatively large. Um, and then I hung this in this project room, which you see here. Um, and of course, there is no budget, so you kind of you would kind of roll them up and send them as a FedEx, like 
you know, like a piece of paper hanging on magnets on the wall. It doesn't look very impressive on these photographs, but photographs lie, as you know. So it was, I thought it was pretty okay for a light inter intervention. And at the same time, I built that project space, um, which you see here, as, also as a model. And I made a photograph which I put in the original space, which you see there. I, so I took out a, um, a Coca-Cola mirror, which seems to be ubiquitous. And so I, and I put a, my own picture into that bar. So at night, when the bar was open, my show was there. At day, when the bar was closed, my show was in the other space. And they kind of connected those two places. That was the idea on that one. Whether it kind of really worked or not was completely unknown to me. You couldn't tell because nobody ever tells you that something is not so great in Japan. So they're enormously polite, which is nice. But also, I didn't know, you know, you don't know what, what a difference a Western artist makes in a tiny little, I mean, it's not that tiny, but it's kind of doesn't have much to do with the art world place in uh, south, southern Japan. And what I did then was, um, that, so that, that thing was working there. I only heard every now and then that people after me, the students and the, and the, and the other professors coming in on that visiting professor um, program, they kind of were become, becoming frequent, frequent guests through the bar. The bar is always empty. The lady was very friendly. The, she's Chinese. She would like make actually very good food, but Chinese food, so it wasn't really a hangout for Yakuza or Mafia. Um, it has a karaoke feature, so it, for the kind of little crowd in Kita Kyushu, international crowd, it was very nice. It became a standard hangout. And that's why I just found out that Rick Richard which is kind of visiting last, week, uh, last year, he made a show called Thomas Demand is here, where he built, rebuilt the bar now standing in another spot in the project room, which you just saw as a one-to-one -one model again. So in a sense, there's a circle kind of where you just, you know, you put a ball into the game and somebody else keeps playing with it. Um, um, could you just do this step from here to here again? Um, so this is a show in the project space of the CCA in Kita Kyushu, uh, which I had to do a show in. And of course, you know, you don't, I, might, I don't make my work in a sense like on site. So I try to find a way of reconstructing that place in my own studio, send, make a photograph or two or three, print them out really easily and then hang them onto the wall of the project space. At the same time, I made a model of the project space, which you see on the next one. On the, on the so what scale is this? How, what is this, this is much smaller. This is the scale of the picture. So I made a small picture of a small scale because these spaces look the same everywhere. And I thought like it would be quite interesting to kind of make a connection between that you know, bland object project space and, and a very heavy, condensed, meaningful bar. I, what I kind of consumed as meaning, uh, yeah, understood as meaningful. I don't know whether it's meaningful for anyone else than me. But it turns out it is, in fact. And, um, and so I could never kind of re replicate the, the the complexity of the building, but I wanted to kind of bring it down to a sculptural um, statement rather than a, I didn't want to make a replica like a Madame Tussaud because that is not really what it is about um, for me. I just wanted to make a, the, the complexity of the sculptural thing, which has like an empty wall, which doesn't kind, it's not like, it's, it's only the echo of an empty wall facing another building. There would never be a building. I wanted to, I didn't want to have the writing on the walls. I, that's, that's not what I, I, I didn't need inscriptions. I just wanted to get the, you know, if you look at the, at the, um, you know, all these kind of cooling systems which hang outside the, hold on, sorry for jumping. Like the cooling systems you see on the, on the, on this, on the narrow part here, which are hanging out of every window. And the, uh, and the weird letterbox and the, you know, everything has like a, I just wanted to tone it down, but at the same, same time, I didn't want to simplify it as a, as, a, as a building. So I didn't want to, I didn't need like oldness of it or like shabbiness, but it looks like a paper sculpture in, in reality already. So. But, but, th but this one is the full scale thing, as close to full scale as it could be. Yeah, but it's right. kind, of, kind of like 80, 88%. I didn't cal calculate it, you know, I'm not making drawings, I'm just making a thing and then I'd make it as big as I can and then it stands there. But you made each of the three facades. No, I made the whole building. So you made, so you could enter. These are three views on the same building. On the same, on the same object that mm -hmm. you made, mm -hmm. and and could you go inside it? Because no. the doors are not open. No, that's what I, you know, I, for me, it's a sculpture, not a house. So I didn't, I wasn't really interested in the inside. Whereas, Rickrit is, which that's the beauty of that project. You see, 
Recruit is about he's you know using it as a bar inside his his construction in the project space. Um, tell me about the these funny moments of blankness. I mean, I, well, n normally I leave them out because I I just want to get things to a state of a prototype or something, which is not so much like what they what they what a meaning they get in, as an inscription. But here, of course, it has another thing which, because I don't understand Japanese. I can't read Japanese, so it would be completely pointless for me, anyways, to have this. So I, what I'm going for is more to, you know, make sure that this white thing on the wall is read as a graphic device, as a kind of a device to kind of make an entrance or whatever, but not more than that. I just don't want to make advertisement, redo advertisement for Fuji Black Label. Actually, the, bar, the beer which is announced on that white thing is called Black Label. And in, in um in sort of evacuating the semiotic of it, if you will, um, you you used a series of terms. You you used the term model, um, house, mm. sculpture. What are? Can you go through your definitions of those terms? Well, a model. You know, like a model. If if you if you understand model as being like your life insurance plan is a model, or the weather forecast is a model, that's the model. I'm doing. I'm doing a model which is kind of simplifying what we know for, about the world onto one focus point. But it's not necessarily to do with the scale, making it smaller, making it handable, or something like that. Yet, at least not in that kind of work. So it's not a model in terms of, you know, so we may, we have a one to fifty per percent model or something like that. But it's a model because it doesn't work as a real player in the real world. You can't go and have a drink there. But it is a it is a proposition as a model, so to say, and it is a house in terms of purely the object has kind of something like windows. So you think you know it has a front, it has a back, it has an entrance, it has a rolling gate. You read building, you know how to read the building even if you have never seen the building. So in a sense, like it's a, it's a super shape for of a, of a house, but it's not a usable house. What what's the other one I said? Sculpture. sculpture. It's a sculpture because I. I mean, it's a, it's, it is like kind, kind of a, a, that's a shaky definition because a sculpture would be a massive volume, but mine is obviously not massive, it's hollow. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of get a sense of the, the volume, the, inter, the interplay of certain geometrical shapes which build something like a bay individual facade. You know, this is not a random Starbucks which always looks the same or something. So that's what I'm after. But I mean, it's also like, it's just full of beautiful things. The color scheme is very different from a European house, for instance. You know, it has this kind of dull, bland green. It has these kind of unproportioned windows with no window frame, where the window is just basically like a cutout, and then the, the window frame is just a very flat thing on the top of it. The whole thing is a steel construction, so it doesn't have, you know, there's nothing to do with concrete or anything. It's just a shape like a box, like really like a better box. But you, but in the end, you did make a space that you go in. Right? I mean, the, you read this as a single space. So, what would you, um, what is the character of this as? Let's call it an installation. Well, I knew first of all, of course, I knew that nobody's going to see that thing, because nobody ever goes to Pierre de Gouchou and goes in a project space. For some reason, this is not a very public space. This is a, it is open and has opening hours. So, I just wanted to do something which reflects the fact that I was there, and I send a postcard back or something like that. I send a you know, a sum up of what I saw back to the thing. And I wanted to have this in a really not institutional way. So it's kind of, it's rolled up pieces of paper, which are actually still there because they didn't send me back um, the work. But, you know, so it hangs down and it hangs in a way like you ha hang um, an ink, ink drawing rather than, you know, watercolor. So it, it's kind of fixed on the top and then it kind of hangs, hangs out on the wall. It's very un... It's but very uncomplicated in terms of presentation. It's a, the most simple way of kind of sending something like a, like a letter. But do you think of this as an uninhabited installation? No, but it's just not, you know, I didn't want to... This, it's just, it should have a lightness. It's not an institution show like you do in a museum. It should have a lightness to it. It should kind of be pre, pretty clear how it came together. And it doesn't, it shouldn't be a, a work on its own because it's connected to... Mm -hmm. The other, the other place on in in the bar. You know, for me that was knowing that there is a photograph of that space in the other space, and that's a 
the other space is, in the, is represented in that space, that kind of in linkage was like what I was after. What's behind me in the picture? Um, the entrance door. I wanted to make a fourth one. I have a fourth image, but I couldn't find it on a computer. But like, I couldn't hang it because then I would, you know, the whole geometry of the face is kind of wrong. Because the original building is more or less three-sided. Four-sided. No, it's uh, five-sided. It's five-sided. The little sides, for no? Yeah. Did I? But that is, uh -huh. you know, then it has the long side. It has a side side, and I kind of basically with one of them I kind of cut two. So it's it, all the sides are represented on the photographs. Well, I, I guess the thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is wallpaper and developed surface drawings, the way that they fold out and fold up to make spaces, to make interiors. It's as you know, though the, you, you... I'm very glad you say that because there is one thing which I also, I just always wanted to do something and I didn't know how to do it. It's like I found a, a, a plan, a, a construction drawing of a, of a tea pavilion of the 15th century for some Kaiser, like some Tenno. And what they did was like to, to travel it, it has fold-ups. So you fold it up and you have all the decoration of all the walls and little nippets which you just kind of put together. So it's kind of, you can roll it and send it, but then you have a three-dimensional space. And that lightness of plan I have never seen until I saw one in, in the Getty, but it's not kind of the European way of planning things because there you make a drawing of the one wall here and the one wall there and the, and the floor plan and everything. But to kind of actually fold understand the fold, you know, understand it as a three-dimensional thing is very beautiful. But you did it inside out. In a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's an artwork in the end, you know. It's just not. It's what does that mean? It's just not. It's not a theory. So it's just not like it has co holes and gaps and is inconsequential in a sense. What is that? What is that? What does it mean to say that it's a? It's an artwork, not a theory. Because it doesn't have to give you an exact description of what the building, how to build the building or something. It's a description of what I saw when I saw the building. Um, okay, but now these are flat images, yeah? yeah? Um, but they're flat images that stand out from the wall, right? They, pro they produce the dimensionality in the wall. It's the physical condi condition of the, pa of the paper, mm -hmm. which has, some, again, something which I kind of thought like would at least be understood in Japan very well. If it's not, you know, I don't want to kind of... What, because of the paper, the three-dimensionality of the paper, you mean? You mean like yeah. origami or that kind of thing, or no, just a like, pa paper fetish? As you know, they never had any oil painting until the late 19th century, when the, when the West kind of introduced them to the technique. So most of what you see as art history there is like actually paper-based. Oh. Then you know, there's a long tradition of pa making paper in Japan, <coughs> which is very seminal to them, which kind of origami is just one kind of, you know, um, outcome of that, but basically it's... Uh, you know, they, they have a certain kind of love to that material, which I would kind of, if I frame it and I put a glass in front of it, not, not only that I have a huge production issue, which I don't, didn't even want to in that case, because, you know, that is a, it should be like a, like, like, like I said, it should be like a letter, and not like a, not like a, not like a package. So. I guess the, the reason I was asking about that in particular was just thinking about the, the, um, the introduction into this process of digital tools mm. and how it's not printing, you know, it has a complicated relationship to these technologies and to think that um, there are all kinds of technologies today like say 3D printed models that are somewhere between paper and not paper, somewhere between two dimensions and three dimensions and wondering whether um, that let's say, ambiguous dimensionality is part of what happens when you produce semi-flat things in a 3D space dealing with this, you know, whether that was, um, uh, let's say, part of the artistic gambit rather than the, rather than the theory. I mean, this is, these are digitally printed? Yeah, that's the inkjet print. A, a very big inkjet. Well, print. it's like three or four. You know, it's also they're not they're not kind of glued together. They're really very low key, low low fi. You know, they they you have like stripes of paper to keep the roll very small. And I like the lightness of that. You know, like I like the fact that I could send it by post, and six weeks later it would arrive there. They would hang it on the wall, and it, that would be the show. And the main thing is that we have the show here, and we have the show in the in the small space, and it doesn't. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't have leverage. It doesn't have a rucksack of, okay, this is this um, this guy. It, it always comes in frame, and it's just this and that, and then we have to transport it back and everything. 
Um, okay, so <clears throat> speaking of the, the, the ease with which images move around mm. that, that you exploit, um, when I think of your somewhat earlier work, I think of it as having begun with images that move primarily through media, mm. um, you know, uh, images that you know, you recognize from the media, or things that get shown in the media, say, um, he did a well-known project of the Oval Office that was on the cover of New York Times Magazine, for example. So it comes from an image that we've seen in the media, and then its natural place of display was in the media. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that when I think of that work, I think of the media as itself the system of dissemination. Um, more recently, I think of you as being the mobile thing. <laughs> Um, you moving around, taking pictures moving around, of things moving around, using an iPhone maybe rather than a regular camera, et cetera, and that the relationship between what's stationary and what's mobile has now changed. And along with that new form of mobility, there are different strategies of installation and so forth that come through and different uh, ideas about architecture's relationship to place and globalization and technology. So anyway, this, this next project I think is, a, is an interesting example of the distinction, the changing relationships between what's stable and what's fixed, both in your world and in your take on the world. Maybe you could just tell mm -hmm. us about this project a little so, bit. So the next one, you know, I said in the other <coughs> few words I said about the, the previous project was um, that the, that the building there had to be moving twice in his life, short lifespan. And I just kind of like the fact that, you know, somebody would actually refuse to, meet, move, uh, to move just because to make space for bigger investment or something. And somehow, in a way, what, if you, if you take, take this rhetorically, you would say the building, the owners of the building would say no, and therefore the building itself is a no too. And you have this as a, obviously, uh, you have this as an architectural trope, which is the holdout, you know, the building where people you know, you keep having them, but people just to, to refuse to move out. And of course, like you, you have a lot of Chinese pictures here, simply because in China, you know, obviously there is the private ownership of land is not existing, but also the private ownership of buildings, mostly many of them built illegally, is not really respected very well. And you end up with this kind of weird topology of images of like people refusing to move, where basically the, big, the building itself becomes a big expression mark of saying no which is kind of sometimes even comical. Um, and it, it became a comical topic as well. So in the top like two, you see like things from the 60s, 70s in the, in the United States. You see um, a little reminder of like the, the down, down there is also in the States, but that's a building where like an old granny didn't want to move out. On the right hand side, you see the fact when they built the building around her and she refused to move. And on the left hand side, she made a, she, she took it ironic and just put these uh, balloons on top to kind of refer to the film Up by Disney, which you saw, which is one of the many in um, ways of like actually making this into a story. The, so the rhetorics of reading the architecture is a, is a, is a rhetorical statement, even if a very, not very complex one, just saying no, is a beginning of a story, a probably sto prob um, a storyline. And you see on the top right one, uh, a drawing from China again, where it became, you know, like a certain house became very notorious for um, the same statement of saying no to move. Um, here are a few more, like these are from Germany, which I, the top right one is one from, is a, is a, is a farmer from uh, somewhere in England who refused to move and then make space for like a, like a highway uh, uh, construction. And so basically um, they split the highway and put, leave, left them in the middle of it. Um, and so that's keeping, you know, like you sometimes you collect these things and you have, you'd never know when you can use them in the, in the Japanese project. I could somehow kind of come back to that in a, in a lighter way uh, because the, the, the owner thought that's kind of the cause of life, you know, you just have to move. Um, but then friends of mine, which I worked on a lot with, like Caruso and John, they got invited to kind of rethink a, a space in a square in, uh, in Zurich, in a new development area in Zurich, former industrial kind of place called Escher Wissplatz. Uh, steel industry left, all the other le industry left already, and it was supposed to be an expansion um, area for all the insurances in Zurich because the city is kind of topo topographically, it can't grow anymore. It's behind, you know, in the back there are mountains, in the front there's a lake. So they have to redevelop what they have and um, they wanted to give space to all the big growing international insurances to, um, to grow. 
And that one square is a little rim. That's how it looks today. And, and they basically asked um, the, the architects to kind of talk to an artist and develop uh, a scheme in a competition of like six invited people, uh, teams, to develop a, a scheme what you could do on this, on this square. And as I kind of owe them deeply because they helped me several times in exhibition architecture, um, I just couldn't say no. But I didn't want to do anything there because it's kind of extremely visible because the Kunsthalle Zurich is next to it. These things tend to stand there for 15 years and if, if you build a building there which sucks, you know, you're basically, you can not show up in Zurich again f for the f next 15 years. So I didn't want to, very reluctant to go. Um, the building, today there's a fountain, the city wasn't very happy with the fountain, wasn't very happy with the flyover. You can't take it down though because there are 70,000 cars a day driving through um, to the airport, in fact. So somehow they wanted to get a replacement for this, but not a, not a fountain. And we proposed to do something functional. Um, this is how it looks today. Can we have a bit of sound? Maybe there is no sound, okay. Uh -huh. there's sound. Anyway, so this is how it looks, kind of not today, but like a year, two year, three years ago. A deeply uninspiring site probably be better left alone. And we kind of you know, went into the first phase of the competition and said, we want to do something social, something people can use. So, because like basically my idea was like that if you do a fountain, the, the trouble with public art very often is that you, ha that you expect from the, from the audience that they kind of um, come, to your pl to come to your thing in the same way as they do, do in a museum. So they stand in front of it, contemplate, you know, hopefully uh, be imp impressed, walk home, have a, have, a, have a moment of enlightenment. If you're waiting for your bus there every day for 20 years, you know, probably that wears off. And so we thought, like, it should be an artwork which you, even if you don't like it, you can use it. Um, the most simple thing would have been a bench, which is a little under complex, but then, of course, we thought, like, we could probably kind of propose some social thing. At the same time, I thought it reminded me strongly of, like, something really dilapidated, the high flyover is from the 60s, it's very ugly. It's like, you know, you would never build a thing like this again, but you can't really get rid of it right now. And so I thought of that one, and I thought also like that we, as, especially me as an architect, I'm invited to, pay, be, to have a group therapy uh, function, like a therapist for the city, you know, like, because there's prostitution there, drug dealing, we want to get rid of all these negative things, we want to have a positive, uh, reading of the space, we want to we want to improve the environment, even if the environment is kind of fundamentally um, uh, spoiled. And so I thought, like, okay, we have something which we need to, you know, we have to fix it with, with like really easy means um, to make the place a livable, nice place to hang out, 24 hours, no crime, nothing. So, therapist, um, that Cody Island thing brought me to this one. Anymore. My analyst says I exaggerate my childhood memories, but I swear I was brought up underneath the roller coaster in the Coney Island section of Brooklyn. Maybe that accounts for my personality, which is a little nervous, I think. So my analyst says I exaggerate my childhood. We, that kind of thought, thing I thought, I proposed them for the, for the first round. We won the first round, thanks to Woody Allen. And then <laughs> I just came up to, I, I said, like, why don't we rebuild this nailing, nail house, which you saw, like, nail house is a, is a saying in, in, in Chinese of, like, somebody who kind of is against the common interest is like a s nail sticking out of a piece of wood. So we translated this into German and said, like, it's called the Nagelhaus. And we basically, I basically argued that you have all these pictures running around all over the world. You have the globalization, which everybody in Europe is, f is afraid of because it might cost jobs and everything moves to China. Why not kind of using Chinese things coming back to Europe, especially if you have all the Chinese money in your banks already. So why not using like images flying around the world as well and just, you know, it had to go there. Um, it was a very famous building because um, Somebody in a, didn't want to make space for a shopping mall in Chongqing, Mrs. Wu and her husband. Her husband was holding out on the top of the roof. They, didn't, they cut off the water, they cut off energy, everything, and people would bring uh, um, food to them, and they still wouldn't go. And I found this rather an amazing monument to resistance. Also, like, that they would let it stay there for that long had some political implications, which you still don't understand really why that happened. But it became this notorious monument. Here, here. 
and um, we thought about, you know, we proposed to re-erect exactly the same building. There's another wonderful piece of footage. Must have been well built, and they did. BBC. But that's a very good one for here. Whoa, here we go. Oh, my <laughs> So, you know, that Nobody plan... Nobody died in the making of this video. <laughs> Can you say that? Well, we just basically, we just, we just went into <laughs> the second phase of the competition and we won the competition right out with a lot of argue, arguing, like fi not an not a anonymous uh, vote, five to four, which is very unusual for any Swiss jury because they always want to have like a no, no normal vote, big fight, but they kind of went for it. We, we, I have to honestly say that I, I wanted to make this a fuck off proposal because the jury was very good. It's a friend of mine, so we had to propose something. But on the other hand, I wanted to do something where they, can, they just can't take it, you know. And of course, they took that one and I didn't have a clue how to do it. And so we had to develop it, propose it to the city. We won the city over, the uh, city council, they took it with a vast majority at the time. We, we, you know, like the other thing, selling point was we wanted to have under the bridge this kind of life of a Chinese life with like lampions. So we, we designed lampions. Um, this is a flyover in between Shanghai and, and Beijing where people just, you know, they use that space because it has a roof. And we thought like we could use it the same way and we proposed to rebuild. And then, you know, all this, the tradition of the Chinese pavilion in European um, architectural history, would, I thought like this was very self-explanatory why we would do that and how we would do that. So I proposed this kind of shabby building um, as a small object. I sent it over to the architects. The architects made a rendering out of it which would sit underneath the fly flyover as you see it there. We had to kind of have a second building with a, with a disabled toilet, a, how do you say, it? disabled people toilet, which will play a certain role later on. So I cut, a, cut out a part of the surrounding building um, you saw in the foreground of the other picture to host uh, a kiosk, um, an ATM, and um, a disabled person's toilet, um, and, the, and the arrest was hollow. So it was like, a, like you see the arcade there, which wasn't used. Of course, we had to do something against the pigeon. So basically, we, we planned the whole damn thing through. I had my visualizations were like a guy who usually does stamps for the Norwegian Post because I didn't want to end up with these computer renderings you usually see for developing projects because like, that is not what this is about. This is a folly rather than a, than a real proposal. We researched how big a restaurant has to be to um, be run by, you know, like to be worthwhile and running, running on its own. We, we calculated with 10 tables or 12 tables. The city kind of did a feasibility study. They went to KPNG and they said you can't run a, possibly a restaurant with 10 tables, which of course is nonsense, you can. Um, so we want to have I don't know how many, how many, but it was too many for like a small crew. So we had to kind of enlarge for a small crew of four. In Switzerland, if you have more than four, you have five, then you have to split the changing rooms by gender, which meant that we needed a basement, which makes the thing incredibly more expensive. Um, okay, so we just, we, we hit the, the margin of the budget exactly for, with, with our project, which was a wood construction, which also had to be wood because of flames and all this kind of thing. So I looked into every little detail, every water hose, well, everything was done uh, according to the thing. And we ended up with um, with the design for the interior. I just, we wanted to have like carved out um, uh, wooden panels. The, for me, the materiality of the whole thing was very important because I wanted this to be um, a surface and not like a material. I wanted this to be clear that the artwork uh, ends at some point and the design or whatever, um, you know, the, the the furniture starts somewhere. I didn't want to design furniture. I didn't want to design cutlery. I just wanted to make a statement. This is a box and I designed that and that's a part of the, that's the artwork and it ends exactly when the beer comes on the, on the bar. Another photograph of that kiosk there and the bar and the thing you see, these lampions, the, they would like actually run in the same size outside of the building all the way down to the flyover up to the station. So we had like 120 of those planned. Um, and then uh, these are the renderings by the city, which I had a little hand on. In the beginning, I thought like it would be really interesting to have a rendering of that, of that place there um, and have it with uh, Chinese people in Swiss, folklore, for, for, for Swiss traditional clothing, which we did and we proposed and we got them back Im immediately. That is impossible because I thought it would be very funny if the, everything becomes kind of this kind of mel melange between different cultures. But so I smuggled in these photographs with Chinese people 
you know, running around on the, on, the, on the Swiss square. But you still see that we didn't want to fix it in a sense of making the whole thing more beautiful than it is. It is a lost place, and we just try to kind of organize a social, social function around that space. Um, so here you see Venice Biennale, Sejima's one for like three years ago. Uh, we made a proposal one-to-one -to, -one to kind of study the materiality, use it for something, and um, also win over uh, the second majority in the, in the, in the county, ca county council or whatever, which we also won. At the same time, there was a, the right-wing party in Switzerland started a campaign because they lost those two votes, and they started a campaign about the costs of the toilet. Um, these are two other kind of, this is a model still, a one-to-one -one model, but it's still kind of just to find out what the color scheme would be, how the, how the lampions would work, the this in and the all outside. Paper. No, this is a, this is a, this is a, how do you call it? Like it's, it is a 3D scan of a, of a, of a corrugated cardboard box in the rain, you know, it gets these kind of little okay. things and then we scanned it and we made it into a pattern and then we, how do you call it, like CNC kind of, uh -huh. Mill, milling, milled. milling, yeah, the mill, mill surface, and then the milling is kind of more detailed at some parts and wider in other parts. So could, we could actually modulate it, but the, the depth, the width, the you know how how many of these kind of little moldings were coming up. But at the same time, we had this campaign running against us, and which I refused to say anything for or against it because I I didn't want to be on a panel. I didn't want to kind of bring this into a political quarrel. Either they wanted or want not. And they said yes already. All the authorities said yes. And this kind of little radical party, which is actually not that little, um, run a public campaign. So in the end, in a sense, I ended up with a with a public campaign against me in Zurich, which was with a golden toilet, and it says like 5.9 million for um, for a shit, which is about the cost of the the cost of the of the of the. the um, uh, they were basically saying everything is too expensive there, and so. Then the, the people which were for the building made this kind of really nice looking rendering poster, everything without me being involved, which of course doesn't get anyone out the house. You know, the, the negative golden toilet everybody gets um, to vote for. But at the same time, of course, you have the artistry where like a pissoir, where, you know, Duchamp is obviously, has a certain thing and I have a campaign running with a golden one. So I thought like, it's kind of funny and I, I gladly lost the whole project. And that's the last picture of that one. Um, so you really spoke like an architect, though, in there a little bit. Mm. Um, the practical, I mean, somehow, it, somehow I think it's like totally interesting that whenever you s start to push the question of where does architecture end and something else begin, you always get to plumbing and ultimately <laughs> you always get to the toilet. Mm. I mean, on some level, if it has a toilet, it's architecture, and if it doesn't have a toilet, it's not. Um, I suppose, I don't know, was there a history of architecture before the toilet? I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not really sure about that. Um, you know, it's a standard interviewer's question uh, to an architect to ask them what is the project that they most regret not building. Um, do you regret not building this? No, I'm this? extremely happy. Not so. <laughs> I think it's actually much better. I never thought we were going to win this anyways. And then with me being so blunt and saying like, look, you can't build this, I know that. Then obviously we triggered something like an eagerness by the city to be extra risky. And then as we really put it through and we just thought about, we had to kind of do a one to 100 plan for everything. So we needed to really kind of figure the whole thing out technically as well for the first uh, round already. So I kind of had to look into how do you, what, what kind of cladding you use, how long does it have to withstand fire, and all these questions, which you usually come to a much later uh, phase. And I realized by then already, I just really don't want this building to be standing there. But did you, did you find thinking about those things interesting? Um, no, but like I owe it to friends, you know. So I just, I really thought like, okay, you know, we, you helped me in things you didn't want to do, so I help you here. But I just thought, and uh, you know, like it's, in the end, it would have been my project. My name would be on it, whether it's kind of well engineered or not. It doesn't matter. So it would be my thing. And I just thought, like, I really, I mean, you know, it gave me ex uh, the the ticket to kind of. I went to Ethiopia, for instance, and I went to Turkey to do research, because what I found in, most interesting part of that is the materiality of the surface, even if it's like really stupid, and that's what every architect wants to go beyond. But I wanted to have like you know you know these kind of churches in Ethiopia which are kind of carved out of one rock you know without any addition. So they have like a three-story ch church which they do from atop with with uh, tools we don't know, 
and they worked 40 years on that, on that construction, including a circular staircase to the third floor. And everything is one piece, you know, there's nothing added. And then they, and they're still using them, other than Syria, for instance, they're still completely in use, complete, you know, since they have been built or like chiseled out, basically. And so I was really fascinated by the fact, where does that building end and where does it start? You know, what is the artwork and how, where do I stop as, a, as this being an artwork? Because everybody would see, oh, this is a Thomas Demand building or something. And then you end up, what kind of plates do I want? Nice ones or not? And you end up in this designer question of like, does there have to be a letterbox? What do I'm doing with the, with the bins? What do I do with the edge between the building and the floor? What do I do with all these kind of detailed questions, which are actually a sculpture, you have to consider them, but you just, at some point, the sculpture ends and the real world begins, you know? And that is, that is a very important point if you, if you look at Brancusi, for instance, you know, but it is, it has an end. Whereas a building had, had a different dimension because it has to serve so many other purposes. And so that was an interesting thing. Then I went to Turkey because there's, a, there's an iron church in, in Istanbul, which has been coming on a ship, basically from Vienna, made out of cast iron. And it's just painted white. It's very interesting because it's again like a building which is completely, it came as a complete church with everything. The benches, everything is coming, you know, cast iron. And it stands there and rusts away. And I found this is, as well very interesting as, a, as an object. How, where, is it an object still or is it already a piece of architecture? Is it a, is it a prefab or is it... And to find out these kind of little things, that I, I found that quite interesting. And then to find a position against this a public campaign, which is kind of evil and shitty, in fact, you know, because it's a right-wing party, which is the same party which were, were, you know, forbid uh, minarets for, for mosques and therefore mosques, basically, but like with a back door. And this one was a back door because like everybody had agreed already and they found a back door about the budget of that disabled toilet where they could bring the whole thing to the down. And now there's nothing, you know, it's just like, it's just they, didn't, they don't have a backup plan, it's just. But, but you started off by saying that in this project you wanted to make something that was usable. I mean, is, I, I, and you mentioned that that Rickrit's mm. intervention in Japan. Mm. I mean, I would have thought that one of the, you know, one of the things about contemporary art is exactly the breaking down of the distinction between the artwork and the social event or the use. Is that something that you think is really important to maintain? Well, there's one use and the other use. That the use that you can still use something which is, has a certain um, autonomy as an artwork, and you can still use it, I think, <coughs> if you do it right. But I didn't want to make some, you know, I needed to kind of have a, a clear distinction between this is my artwork and this is the rest of the world. And this distinction, this kind of, you know, connection point, the surface, that was an interesting point for me. But I wanted, you know, like basically we wanted to do something which you can use if you don't like it. You could, you know, many artworks you don't like, but you could still kind of, it still has a role in the, in the, in the square. It's quite interesting, the, the, the vote came out, it, ha it got a very, very comfortable uh, majority in this, in, at the site, in that part of the town, and it had a, it, we lost it in the, on the, on the mountains, where the rich people are, with the villas and everything, where no, nobody ever actually goes there because it's too ugly. That's where we lost the vote. But you know, it's we lost the vote, so there's no. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about whether. I mean, let me just put it in more bluntly: Can architecture be an artwork? Oh man, yeah, this is difficult, especially <laughs> that here. That sounds like a polite no. <laughs> No, I mean, it's a you difficult. Don't have to be polite. It's a, Just say no, 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 no. It's a, it's. I'm not saying no because I, I. First of all, I have to think about this. But this is not a question. You know, I don't even think about my own thing. Is this art or not? I just make these things, and somebody lets me show them. You know, so it's just. <laughs> It's just not, it's not a really kind of a good que question because in the moment... I well, that's just because it's hard to answer doesn't make it a good question. No, you no, were very no, no, sorry, clear no as insult, long as you no drink insult. a beer. You, no. you were very clear. With, no, I'm, I mean, I'm just mm. joshing with you, but you were very clear. The plate is not the art. Mm. The drinking beer is not the art. There, there were moments in the way you were analyzing this and, and you were saying that at a certain, there, there is a line and at least per object you were confident about mm. where that line is But that comes completely from the project and where I know where I, w I feel comfortable, you know, having a decision, a formal decision. But if you ask me on the spot, like, is architecture, can architecture be art, that is a, pr that is a, that is a statement which kind of obviously has to be able to be applied to something else as well. And I would say, in the moment I say architecture cannot be art, one of you guys out there will make an architecture which is art. 
You know, that's the definition of art, is always once you say this is not art, somebody comes up and makes exactly that, and it becomes, therefore, becomes art. So, and that would be bad or good? No, one, one has to be very careful with these kind of, you know, saying, oh, no, no, architecture can't be art. I mean, much architecture <laughs> isn't art, let's put it that way. Some others probably come very close. Yes, but it's a, just a... Um, but I don't know why people want to be artists, you know? Like, you you I tend mean, to make more money than the rest of us. <laughs> that would be one. I mean, if we but just go to the obvious. But your stuff lasts much longer. You know? What? Your stuff lasts much longer. Our stuff lasts much like longer. Like a building that plays so a role sure. in a city, which is kind of unpredictable to the rest of the city. The city changes, the building's still there. So, per, so per permanence would be good? No, not, you know, I'm not trying to be an architect. It's just more... The, you know, like we, I mean, I'm working with architects for a long time, and I, what I like about them, what I would like working with them is just it, it is not necessarily a problem you ask yourself all the time: is this now art or is this an architecture? You know, it kind of we 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 have different ways of working with the same problems, and we have different ways to find a solution. And you just, as an artist, I have to be very careful that people can still distinct the different solutions from each other, so that everything becomes everything, because then you end up with two two dilettantic approaches. No, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to make everything become everything. I'm trying to understand what things are and how they operate in the world. And also, frankly, I'm quite interested in the license that somebody like you is given and the lack of license that other people are, you know, I, I think that these distinctions, we can argue them one way or another here. But as you know perfectly well, when you're out in the public and dealing with money and dealing with sites and dealing with institutions, these d distinctions are significant. Mm. So for example, you were describing your entry into the process of dealing with a public art thing that was at an architectural scale, was to be, be asked to play the role of urban therapist. Right, so that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it would be standard to ask, well, I was about to take it back, about asking artists to play urban therapists. I mean, I suppose Sarah would be, I mean, there would be moments in which we could discuss what, what that might mean. I suppose the thing that I'm really trying to be very polite about asking, which is not, because it's maybe not a very polite question, but it's not not polite to you. Um, I'm, T tell us about the architects that you work with and why you have chosen to work with them and why you like them so much. Um, Caruso and John and Arno Brandelhuber, um, the, the, those are the two main figures I kind of worked with. Um, and for me, the, it came basically, it came up at some point, I like architecture and I think I, I'm a kind of a, like an interested hobby guy. Hmm? Caruso St. John. From London. And so I had, a, I had an invitation to a show in, in uh, Cartier Foundation. I kind of had the feeling that I know enough about architecture to kind of read it and see a problem when it comes to me, but um, not enough to, I'm not an architect. I did, never studied it. I actually also never studied photography, so I'm, I'm an amateur on both um, ends. And so I ended, I, you know, I got this invitation, Condas Your Cartier, doing a big show for, on my own work in Paris. It's a Jean Nouvel building, and it's basically, if you read the building and you try to analyze it, it is, it is a building which is a big vitrine for jewels. And on top of the vitrine, there is the administration for that. But in the, in the structure of the building is very reminiscent of the Palazzo Pitti, where you have the, the main harsh rustica ground floor and then you have the smaller ones upstairs where the king is living and in a way it's like only that it's transparent and kind of looks demo you know like look, looks see-through or something it doesn't make it more more democratic or whatever you would apply to glass architecture usually um, and it also determines what kind of stuff you can show in there and I kind of I, you know and then they came to me and said like you want to kind of show in the basement because the basement is a contained space like this and you can hang your thing on the wall and I said no I'm not going to go to the basement you know I just want to show in the space, which is uh, up here, like you know, to walk in. But I needed an architecture, and then I looked into the architecture. Of Jean Nouvel for art is kind of proposing himself, which is most of the cases uh, a joke. And then I looked into the possibilities they found so far for like showing art in there. And mostly, it's like a big object in the middle, or like a, you know, a plane by Mark Newson on the side. Or, but it always has this kind of jewel box kind of idea. And I knew that I need to do something, but this doing something would probably be the work. 
you know, if I build a house in there to show my own work, I would be stupid to hang my own work in there. The house would be the work. And I just wanted to get away from that because I wanted to show my work. That's why I came into it. But I also didn't want to modify my work for Jean Nouvel's idea of art, which is really ridiculous, I have to say, really ridiculous, you know. So yeah, I didn't want to print my stuff on sticky foil to kind of play on his windows or something like that, like so no birds fly in anymore, which was actually a big problem they had. And I just, I kind of found myself in a metaphorically, like here with a th group therapist, I found myself in a situation where I'm, a, I'm the guest of a talk show and the, you know, the CBS invites me, but the host is missing. And so I thought like maybe the architect I asked to help me would be the host, so it kind of is, it's the angle between the, the, the TV, TV station and the, and the guest. So the guest doesn't have to explain himself, but like he gets, a, he gets a surrounding where he can show what he wants to show, which would be of interest for the audience of the TV station, but not like do everything. And um, with that kind of idea, I came to a couple of people which turned out all to be great architects now, or like at least significant architects, and one of them was Caruso and John. At the time, they, they were rebuilding like a house, like a really, t really shitty little house for themselves. <clears throat> and I found it, I just found it very kind of interesting because also in London, there is hardly ever any contemporary architecture, at least like t 15 years ago. There was no small project, you know, because nobody had the money. No, it wasn't corporate, nobody ever employs an architect there for like a private house, so I thought it would be, and I really like the house, you don't see that very often, so I it was very hard, and it was also around the corner from my studio, admittedly, in Islington. So I worked with them, and I, and then we had, uh, you know, and from there we kind of had like other things to go on, and that's, it always worked very well, they understood what I need, they understood where they could, you know, they didn't, I didn't want to have a neutral space, because my work you can hang anywhere, so it, I didn't need something where you just eat like a cloister where you bring down, you know, depreciate people of their senses. So you just kind of, you know, I needed a wall where I can hang something on and I needed an organization of the space where I can t tell a story or kind of, con you know, configure a thought or something like that. And also make, uh, make a surrounding where the architecture becomes um, like an exhibition feature in the sense that it it is still kind of gu guidelined by me and my work, but it is something which you remember later on. Do you, do you think of them as collaborators, or um, what would the other word be? Facilitators. No, friends, they're just friends. That's friends, and th that's why I would kind of really look into the Nagel House to do something, because I just <laughs> thought I couldn't let them down. I didn't want to let them down. I didn't want to say, look, I can come up with a better project, because they would never say, to me, like, you know, come up with a better p place or something. But it was really interesting when I did the project in the National Gallery with them, they kind of proposed curtains in the thing, and then I kind of thought, like, of, I thought of curtains myself, but then I thought it has something really stuffy about them. And I thought, like, mm. and then I was afraid that we don't never get to be able to pay for the, for the textile, which you need, and the Mises building, you need, like, kilometers, five kilometers to be exact. And, <laughs> and so... <laughs> You just, you know, we were, I just was frightened and I said like, so what if I get, don't get it through? Do we have another idea? And I said, no, we don't have another idea. <laughs> Maybe someone else has a better idea. And that I found that very liberating because I just, you know, it's also, they have an idea or they don't have an idea. Um. I, d and then I just thought it was interesting, you know, I was sort of looking them up and when you look them up in the architectural press, what you get is your name. That's, um, that's unfortunate. You're looking up the wrong, the wrong websites. They're working for the Tate, for instance, all no, the Tate no, written I, thing I, they do, which doesn't have anything to do with me. And they, I mean, they did a lot of, they do all the Gagosian spaces outside of New York. Yeah. And I'm sure they used kind of some of the knowledge about how, how you know, what art needs from our collaboration. So it kind of did them well as well. They did a couple of institutional show, um, things in London, in, in Nottingham, a beautiful thing where the urban planning element is fantastic which I recommend everybody to go. They're probably the best new building in the, in the museum world in, in the last 10 years in Britain. They're building a big thing in Zurich, by the way. They're building an ice hockey uh, stadium in Zurich in 2017. So they're really busy, you know. It's not like, the, it's, a, it's an organically growing office. They never want to have more than 40 people, which I find completely reckless, but like apparently architects have a much bigger office. You and think 40 is reckless? That's what I could know? never have 40 people in one room. It, it drives me crazy. Okay, but so speaking of collaborators, um, mm. 
now collaborating with other kinds of producers and existing architecture. Maybe you could tell people about the dailies. And so what I just said about the, um, the, the host, the TV host, it's just also like doing a show which has a certain kind of um, echoing in, you know, has a certain, how do you say, like a, a reverb or something like, you know, like it comes, um, a show, a show can be always more than just the pictures you send them over. And as I do very little work, not much, five pictures a, a year is a very good year. It takes me ages to make them. I want to make them myself. I don't want to have a fabrication line because I just, you know, that's my luxury. It's like I can do the speed of the work myself. I don't think it should be too much of the work. It shouldn't be everywhere. It shouldn't become a look. And so I want to co take the liberty to kind of actually consider it as much as possible. But that means that like very often I get invitations to shows and all I can show is like if I show the work of the last 10 years, it might be very close to another show I just did two, two years ago. And that kind of dilemma, I was thinking about how to kind of solve that. And I, th I thought a show should have a certain character of individuality as a show, which is not like any other show. So I designed wallpaper to do the Serpentine Gallery, which came out of considerations of the Serpentine Gallery, a tea pavilion. In a, in a tradition of design of William Morris in a park, so you go to the park, you go through the park to see the show. At the same time, the, the, the pavilion has been refurbished as a normal gallery space, and now if you do two-dimensional work, you end up placing the work exactly where Chris Ophelia put his his work, and Andreas Gurski put his work, and Glenn, you know, and all the same people, uh, all the all the people have to kind of hang their work on the same spot. You literally could leave the nails there and hang something else in there. And I just wanted to change the place in a sense to make it more domesticated again as a tea pavilion. And for me, it, William Morris was important to understand what a wallpaper could be and the re repeat of a wallpaper. So basically I asked the same company who does still print the, the, um, the William Morris whether they would kind of work on a, on a wallpaper with me. And so I made an ivy wallpaper, which has a certain repeat in four different colors, four different rooms. But that was the background for my show. And like National Gallery, as I said, I did curtains. I just, you know, I always try to find a way of like how to make this in an interesting constellation. And obviously that comes to a point where you just kind of involve other people's like services in a sense. And you don't want to say, okay, I just pay you and you walk away and it's all mine or something. So I started kind of bringing people in like in the catalogs and the things and to just, you know, make it clear that this is the, the reason for the show is my work, but that doesn't mean that the show has to be all my work. It can be like, you know, going around places. And I had this invitation to do something in Sydney, and we kind of looked at all these sites of a, of a guy who does this since 25 years. The first project he ever did was with Christo wrapping a cliff in Queensland, and um, 72 or 73. And so his name is John Caldo, and he does these projects, and I was supposed to do number 25. And we couldn't find a space until I had like finally an afternoon on my own and I was strolling through Sydney and I found, I, I looked at this building there which is uh, quite amazing and it seemed to be it's nobody knows it and like ask my, I asked actually on the street who, what is in this building. It stands right in the middle of a, of a, of a pedestrian zone in Sydney, downtown Sydney. The Gucci shop is across the street, Prada shop is, so it's the best location but nobody knows what that building is. And, and so I kind of smuggled myself in. Turns out it's the, it's the Commercial Travelers Club in Sydney, which has been founded in the 1880s for Englishmen who want to do trade in a, in, in a, in, in a continent lacking complete, a complete lack of intra infrastructure. So they needed a, a outpost there, which they can do cons correspondence with, probably stay. It used to have like up to 40,000 members, incredibly rich. Everybody who is a member still gets a free funeral. And so I just, but it's a club of people and like they have 380 members now. Everybody seems to be over 84. And so it's just like it's this dying out thing which nobody needs anymore, but it's so well funded that they don't have to go, they don't have to move. And in 72, they sold most of the land they had in the inner city to a developing thing and which Harry Seidler built. And Harry Seidler, which is an Austrian architect, we went, went uh, uh, to Australia and built all the high rises there for many, time, many years. He just proposed them to kind of make a swap of the land and he wanted to minimize the footprint of the building and made a deal um, that he would kind of give them a modern hotel and, and, and meeting facilities which would be downstairs. Nobody would do that anymore. It's pretty moldy there as well. But you have this kind of mushroom architecture, <coughs> which was at the time 
you know, the stud work there, the design you see is from Navi, so it kind of actually it was kind of interesting, but now it's forgotten, nobody kind of stays in these. You see the first floor is like 15, 16 rooms f with one bed, and the upper floor is uh, 12 with two beds. It's very beautiful, but it's also completely out of anything, any context. And I just thought like that would be really interesting if we do a guerrilla show and we just rent the first floor in, in its entirety and make hotel art come back. And um, so I walked in there in this space, no, but, you know, which doesn't have much of an access. It has a circular stair, uh, a, a corridor, which you, it's kind of doesn't have a single design feature. It's really inside the room. It's just so nondescript, but also most of the stuff is either replaced, but basically has carries the charm of the 70s. And nobody ever changed it. It's not grabby. It's not old. People are still living there. I mean, staying there overnight. But it is, of course, I mean, impossible. And um, for me, it was a beautiful gallery of like things, you know, like what you know, like the the bedcloth, for instance. So the bedcloth, you never see all the rooms at once. Once I finally had the possibility to see them all, you realize that there's a whole gallery of bedcloth in there, for instance. And uh, the bins. Every each room has a different bin with a different bin liner. So. <laughs> Um, there's a design by Harry Seidler also for the car carpet downstairs. So it's kind of this kind of time, uh, how do you say, time bomb? No, time, time warp? Time... Capsule. Capsule, exactly. This is the, the current uh, president of the club, by the way. Very friendly man. <coughs> he was easily won o over. <laughs> and so, you know, this is where they have their meetings, but it's so hopeless down there. Just really nobody goes. And I had this kind of series of works at the same time, which are smaller and which I do kind of, I call them dailies, because they're kind of really tiny little things on the side. And they, they printed with a very old fashioned technique, which was very popular in the 70s. And I thought that maybe we can match the two things. I rent all the rooms, and every each of the room gets a picture. Um, these are kind of, you know, sometimes they, they tell a little story of failure, like this one, or of beauty aside, or like. These are the pic these, these are, are my pictures. pictures. Yeah, these pictures are my pictures. Pictures of paper models. Exactly. Yeah, sorry. And so I would. Um, this is from a gym in Japan, actually in Kita Kyushu, um, like a swimming pool. And I don't know, you know, why would be a flower stool like this standing in a man's changing room in a swimming pool in Kita Kyushu? But like, this is outstanding in its own beauty, I thought. So, and then, you know, and this is in Switzerland, and you realize that everything you do, you know, all these pictures have to do with your travels around places, and you see these tiny, tiny little side things. And so I decided to have these pictures very hard to photograph, so don't worry. I have these pictures in the rooms. Um, this one, for instance, would kind of then have a certain echo to the outside. So you, has, you see this kind of dangling, um, dangling light uh, socket there, which I saw on a provincial airport in Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Exactly. And that, then, so, so that's not a picture of the hotel. That's a picture. No, that's my picture, of and Ethiopia. I placed this pl picture in a hotel in room hotel. where, when you, if you look outside the window. It's a circular building, so you would have a full panorama over the whole surrounding there. You, you would look out the window and you would look down to Tiffany.com, and the guy who kind of carries the watch there in a certain angle, I found very fitting to that dangling socket there. Or you have this here where people come out this um, subway, and then the picture inside would be of an ashtray with these, you know, with these people with these kind of cigarette butts in there. So somehow it is not really like something I had to prove, but somehow I thought formally maybe people kind of make make uh, connections between the inside and the outside. So basically, this weird kind of stripy window, like the, like like in a bunker, which also kind of took all the all the sound away. So you would you would lo look down onto the onto your own surroundings, not hear anything, like in a in a weird muffled dream state. And you would probably realize, with the pictures uh, um, as guidance, what a wonderful formal um, display you have in front of the window. Um, so this would be the picture to that. Or this one, I thought, you know, you have this kind of weird cafe where people have their lunch, their business lunch, and it has this kind of weird glass thing there. But it's also like there's the light outside, and inside I'm standing in this lonely hotel room. And so I thought this would be a picture which would fit that situation very well. Or you have like the same view in the next room. You see this, again, you see the, the, the glass thing, the canopy, which basically keeps the water, out, uh, the rain outside the, the lower floor of that shopping mall there. And I thought of a cloth hanger, 
which you have in a garden very often and with the same kind of gardening, you know, design with the curve and everything. So I made this picture hanging in there, given that it's a very associative kind of connection. But in a sense, I thought like when you walk through the whole thing, you will get the point. Or this one, you look on the roof of the neighboring building and you have all these kind of round, weird, you know, of course not weird, but like technical forms with shapes which you have there, which have to be there, but nobody ever goes to the roof. So I thought I paired this with a photograph of like this one, like two, bu two cups in a bucket. So everything you look, see here in these photographs of my own work, this is all a paper model, mostly done in LA, or this one here, which would kind of, um, with the grid on the ceiling and the, and, the, and, the, and the blinds being irregularly hanging, dangling down there, would, you know, be opposite side of the Prada, Prada shop. At the same time, you would, it would smell very nicely, because when I came in, I thought I didn't want to renovate the space much, but I wanted to make you feel you like in a real time capsule or in, you're not like, it's not depressing, but you, you have this kind of sense of luxury. Sometimes like fashion comes back with like a, a retro thing which you recognize and you suddenly realize what a beauty that was or something. And I wanted to have the same feeling. So as I happen to know Mutual Prada from previous projects, I called her and said like, can we have a perfume? So the whole hotel smells like your Prada shop because I heard that people have that, you know, that every, every boutique has its own smell. And she said, we don't have any perfume for the thing because like the leather goods would, they smell so strongly that that's the smell, that's the kind of branding smell. But I could make you a, dis um, uh, a scent. So I basically sent her a book, which I made of all the pictures of the, of the, what I wanted to do in the, in the thing. And they kind of sent me different th scents and we worked ourselves to a perfume, which was dispersed behind the fridge from little dispersers in, inside the space. At the same time, I had a, this one is a wall next to the, next to the building you just saw, where there were, if you look carefully, there, is a, there, was, there, were letter, there was lettering on the facade, which kind of, I think it's a Commonwealth Humpty Dumpty Bank or something, it says. But of course, the lettering kind of is taken off. I had a picture with a, with a pin board where you see that the pins are actually making a beautiful abstract pattern. But of course, the pattern is, not a pa is only kind of coming from somebody taking the pin to another position. And, um, and in, in every room which you saw, I, we, just, we just left it, we just hung the picture, we had the smell, but we had these kind of little menu cards which used to stand in there, which basically would say you can't have everything here. Uh, it's a non-smoking room and you know, there's no room service. And I, I had like Louis Begley making me a short story, which we cut into 15 parts. And so every room became a short story on its own as well. Every room became a part of a short story, and so whatever you go through, you see, I have a fragment of that short story, and it would be going around. So let, let me just add, I mean, we, uh, the, where is the picture of a room? There's no room. We're, so you're, you're also not saying that you repainted the walls? Well, we had to repaint. It was a good, in the beginning, I didn't want to, but I had to repaint because there was a TV in there, and I didn't want to have a TV in there. Okay, but so, but, 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 I mean, I, I think that the, 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 one of the things that's the most intriguing to me about your work is the very tight conflict between the, let's say, dematerialization of the image, which is something that we associate with the discourses on contemporary photography, and on the other hand, a certain insistence in the materiality of the uh, means of seeing an image. So in your work, the framing is very important. The three-dimensionality of the physical image is very important, even though the image itself is very clearly part of a kind of digital universe. And I think that that question, that line between the problem of representation and immateriality on the one hand, and the, the question of the palpability of its material presence is probably the line where your work is the most interesting in relation to architecture, I, for me, in, in any case. And in this particular project, which is one which is not in a gallery space, et cetera, it actually occupies a building. Um, it, I think of it as, as raising questions about the, que about the visibility of these works and about the notion of experience. So in this one, you have um, smell, you have these pictures that you don't really read as pictures. So in the room, they look like hotel art. You don't, in fact, read them as works of art in a traditional sense. The walls have been completely painted. The bedspreads have been redesigned and unified. 
So there becomes this, and uh, you were going to take a second to say, it's not just that then you've got Mutra Prada spritzing you as you come in and you've got stories on the refrigerator. It's that the, the kind of poetry of the ladies who clean the space, I and mean, you guys know the tradition of labor and invisible work and, and so forth, you have all of these things that you actually don't see, but that produce the combined effect of the work as a whole. So somehow you would have to ask, I mean, uh, you know, one asks, what is the limit of this work? Like, mm. so if you sleep in there, is that, could, could you sleep in there and have it still be the work? Or yeah. is it like the other, you know, does that, is that like the beer that you drink that ruins it? No, it wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, the work is like, I, you know, it's a constellation. The work is hanging on the wall. The work is the reason. It's the kind of the entry, the invitation came through the work. And I, find, I wanted to kind of, com, you know, construct a, um, a narrative, construct an environment which is so dense that you can't really say it's just the work, you know, it's just like actually the, the show, and the show will be remembered as this, sh as this kind of two-month event or like even six weeks event in this building. Nobody ever realized it's actually there. And then you realize the building is an amazing construct and it's an amazing thing, but then showing only the building as such would be someone else's work. And so I try, I try to kind of, you know, push this f further through and try to kind of um, go over the humps of what would be an obstacle, which is, for instance, the moldy smell, because it's a concrete building and, like, air circulation, the, the AC is ice cold, but on the other hand, it's just actually really not nice to be there. And so you have to come, I have to kind of take people by the hand and get them over the hump of, like, look, this is really a rundown old place or something. That same thing is like that we had, you know, this, the, the, the room service is the same lady since 72, and it's an amazing person who is, has lots of piercings and everything, and you would never, it's a little elderly lady, but like, she's not like, you know, she's not like part of that old businessman kind of tradition. And she has this choreography, how she kind of places the cup on the side, and like how she does this, and how she does that. And she does it every day. And like since these 16 rooms plus 12 rooms upstairs. And I found this kind of, as it, as it is functioning, it's not only a piece of architecture, it's also this kind of forgotten place. You know, it's a forgotten, structure, it's a forgotten ritual or something, and I've, I wanted to intervene with that without exposing it or denouncing it, and I wanted to intervene with it and giving you from that perspective, point of perspective, a different reading of your surroundings as a viewer. Would you, as a conceptual artist, do you, which I've, heard, which I've seen in interviews you describe yourself as, would you, I'm not sure how to ask this, so presumably a collector could buy an individual photograph, can a collector buy a certificate of the whole mise en scène? No. No. What about the Mucha Prada perfume? Um, then you have to ask Mucha. Mucha. And I mean, I mean, for, I didn't want to mention her really, because on the other hand, it's kind of mean to not to you know like to use her, and then not not so because it's a certain danger of name dropping. Louis Begley is like, of course, I wanted in there because Louis Begley is like one of the most prolific or the most important business uh, contract um, lawyers in America, and of course, he was in Sydney many many times to kind of negotiate contracts there. He didn't ever stay in his hotel, but he most of his life he spent as being a, like a super high-profile guy, a business guy, and so and then in the, his later years he started writing and he kind of went away from this law, law, lawyer's office. But he knows the reality of that lawyer's office traveling, suit, pack your suitcase tomorrow. I'm in Sydney, then I'm um, to Hong Kong or something. He knows that in and out, and I had the feeling that he would understand what I need here or what I what what his kind of place could be on the menu cards, how this could work. And Mutra, is, it's just because it was opposite side of this thing, and I never expected her that she would actually do a perfume for that, but of course you say you don't say no then. No, I'm just sort of interested in the idea that all of these different works, these smells, this performance of the maid, all of these things come to rest for a moment and then disperse out. I'm sort of curious to think about where they go and what kinds of lives they have yeah, afterwards. Yeah, but that's what I think a show should be, you know. It's there, and if, it, if you don't go there, you don't see it. It's just not, otherwise you can go online. So we have to speed up, no? Yeah, we do. I'm going to ask you one last question, and, and that, or raise uh, one last project, maybe, and then and then open it up to anybody. No, let me go through this first. So oh. we have a certain structure here. Next one is model studies. is a photograph. It's, it's based. It's coming from us um, originated in a series of works I did about the models, uh, working models of John Laudner, which I found in the Getty Research Institute, and I showed them. Um, amongst other places in the, in the Venice Biennale together with works by Martin Boyce and vitrines by Sh Thomas Scheibitz 
and um, photographs of the Wuchtemas, I don't even still don't know how to pronounce that school, but like the school of architecture of the 20, 22 to 27 in Moscow, um, which you see here. So the Boisk thing is this canopy. My photographs are on the wall, obviously, and the, and the Wuchtemas kind of things are on, in, on little archival plates in the, in the vitrines here. Um, these are the Wuchtemas photographs, which I found unbelievably beautiful, but also like they obviously, they, they meant to be architectural without being a building. They had these kind of tasks, which now are ubiquitous in arch architectural schools, but at the time, you know, Melnikov, Elisitsky, Rochenko would all teach there. Would be quite revolutionary, it's like saying like two, two uh, circles meet in space, forming a parallel or something. So, and they had to do this within a week, come up with a scheme, which wasn't supposed to be architecture, and then photograph it, and that was part of the, part of the brief. And the photographs are anonymous, and they, most of them are sitting in a CCA in Montreal, which I happened to see. Then. And I was working on this series of photographs of the Lautner models where I didn't want to make portraits of Lautner's designs. It was just a, the springboard for my own work, where I basically photographed these things as objects, as communication tools. You see, um, you know, that's, I would name them, I would no, never kind of really kind of try to describe the, the, the architectural scheme but to, to describe the physicality of that object. He wasn't a great draftsman. He had people, he made a model, he changed the model, he discussed the model with his team, like everyone else does. And he, but these kind of, mo all the models which are still in existence are of projects which have never been realized. And that you didn't remake them? No, I just used them as they are, because I thought like, how if, how, what if I kind of photograph my, not my own models for a change, but photograph someone else's models, obviously they, um, are printed in a size which is nearly architectural, like a window or like a door when you stand in front of it. And this is in the Graham Foundation where I combined the same work with um, drawings by Fernand Léger on the, on the thing. This is, these are photographs done with the iPhone, so it's not, they're not, they, you know, the stuff in the vitrine is not there, but you can see in the vitrine there would be Chaplinard by Fernand Léger. Um, that's an illustration for like a, like a screenplay by Ivan Goll, where he just, in, the in the 1919, he, um, he, he draws Charlie Chaplin as, like, as, a, as, a, as a starting point for a very abstract graphic design. These are drawings he did in the trenches of the First World War, where he, while sitting in Verdun, which is the most atrocious of all the battles in the First World War, he would actually draw his comrades as tin men, which I found at, at the same time outrageous, but also very touching. A long issue, we can't really talk about that, but we got these drawings from the, um, and this is about a sense of abstraction, even in the most unlikely con you know, confines. And these are photographs by Francis Brugier, which is a forgotten uh, fashion photographer from the 20s, who made these abstract photographs, um, 1922 to 1930, which I, I kind of came ac across a couple of years ago, and then for this, it seemed to be the right thing in terms of the architecture, the show, and the context and everything, and it turns out it was the first, the biggest show since 40 years of that person's work. So that was the, just a brief introduction, so you know what you're looking at. Can you, can you go back to the Lautner just for a second? Yeah. So, um, uh, so I think for, for anybody here who is a historian who has worked in an archive, you go in an art, you know, you see these, um, these lonely objects that have often been sitting there decaying and they have, um, they have a certain kind of evocativeness um, if you can get them away from the registrars who are trying to suck the life blood um, out of them. Um, but it, it started to make me think about um, the, the issue of uh, model photographs and architectural photography and the general criticism that is often leveled at architecture in general, that it likes to photograph its buildings without people in them, um, and that you photograph architectural models without people in them, um, and that you make architectural models and you're sort of the only one who gets to go in them. Mm. Right, so there's a, there's a strange, there's a strange, let's say, sociality involved in the relationship between photography and architecture. And as I started thinking about the photographs, particularly of the Lautner models, well, I wondered what you thought about that, because somehow these seem um, to have a question, they, they raise sort of in art historical terms the old fashioned notion of empathy. They are not about an evacuated uh, subject. They're as though the kind of 
they're like a Dorian Gray almost, like an aging Lautner getting older and older in the archive, somehow being present in these, in these models. They have a very different set of affects for me than the other um, photographs, and I wondered whether you had any thoughts about that. Well, first of all, I thought, like, as I said, like, it, I just thought, I, I mean, I came to the Getty as a research scholar, and I try to, end, you know, I end up in, a, on, in front of a computer screen, which I could have done anywhere. And because the research institute has, like, of course, computerized lists, you can't walk down the alley and find, out, find wonderful things like you imagine that, you know, or they promise you that. And so you just, I kind of ended up there, and I'm saying, like, I found it really uninspiring, and I, but I wanted to do something with that possibility. And so I said, like, what about all these things you can't really put in, into file, you know, into a folder? What about those, you know? And they say, oh, we have this odd lot in Van Nuys where all this stuff goes, which we don't really know how to, we don't, can't really dump it, but we don't know what to do with it. And amongst them were these lot, no, these 12 models. And they too fragile to be shown, because they also, he, you know, he basically dumped them behind a, a cupboard, and then when they cleared out his studio, of course it was a bequest, and so you couldn't kind of throw them away anymore. He didn't throw them away because he had his project done. And I liked about them that on one hand they're so fragile, also like they kind of, they have a lot of corrections on them, which you see in the middle one, for instance, there's no, only a landscape left and no, not even a, thing anymore, um, like not, not even a, a building anymore. He used them to as a communication tool, not a representation model, so hence the title, model studies. So it's kind of not something to convince a client, like a usual architectural model which you were just talking about. It's just more like to, like a, like a three-dimensional thought. And so if you talk to Frank Geary about it and many other architects, they love Lautner for that hands-on approach to, you know, getting a model into a building and like just correcting it like a like a like a carpenter rather than a than an intellectual you know like an architect and so by the way Leger was an architect too which I found quite interesting and so um, um, I kind of you know like I thought like these kind of they, they at least I want to I want to find out whether I can get something out of them which hasn't been seen before then the trouble with Lordner most of the Lordner buildings is maybe it's not as pressing anymore as I thought in the beginning but I, they don't photograph very well the buildings. So the mis when I came to LA, I knew Lautner is someone, and of course in an architectural university, Lautner is maybe for some will be God or something. But it, it, he's not like a, he's not like me. So he's not like you know one of those or Rem or you know like completely everybody agrees. Oh, this is really great. And it, partly it has to do with the fact that you have to walk through a building to understand what the power of these buildings is, because they. They not for to, they're not made to look good on photographs, I think. You know, some Water? of them, yeah, some of them better, some of them, most of them not. <coughs> Schulman's photograph of, for my liking, you know, like with that Schulman modernist kind of view on onto that, then suddenly the roof looks heavy and bulky and concrete and heavy-handed and clumsy and look so many things look unresolved. When you stand there, you know exactly why that is and how it kind of unfolds in space. And somehow I thought. You know, that's why I was wrong about Lord Nobina before I looked at it closely. Because I simply thought, like, mm, that's, maybe it's the photographs which are don't, not, don't look very good. And then you talk to European architects and they always tell you that but it's... But do you think that these things really have anything to do with Wartner anymore in particular? Which, that they don't photograph very well? No, no, no. No, well, this one is a much more Lautner-esque Well, but moment. it's the model on the side, you know. It's not yeah. even... It's Marina Fine Arts, so it's not like... No, but I'm talking about them as works independently of, I mean, I, I think it's hard to have it both ways, that either there is a, an architectural content and you would use architectural values to judge the work, or the work does something else in relation to the architecture. And I guess the thing that I was, you know, the Lautner, the studies of Lautner are interesting because they're the ones that you don't make the physical thing that you're taking the picture of. So the mm. thing is just in the framing, so you see it in, in a slightly different kind of way. No, I'm just say, describing my way to that work. To I'm get not describing to what you should think of it. I've never described what people should think of my work. The, you know, the people should look at the work. It's just like, that's, I came through the Getty, I saw this, I was puzzled by my own misconception about Lautner. I kind of, I realized why that might be, which I just described. And then I kind of had a look to the, uh, at these objects, which I could have an access for an afternoon or something, and photograph them without touching them, without bringing light. And so it's all rather improvised, but I, that's what I liked about the whole idea of doing them. Well, by, by way of maybe tra you know, seeing if anybody has a, 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 a question or two before we, we really need to end, but I guess I'll just say what I think, of, what I feel maybe 
I never talk about how I feel. Um, <laughs> what I think um, when I look at these when I look at these um, pictures, um, I, you know, for me they're a little bit like uh, falling into the looking glass. That in a lot of your work there seems to be a, a kind of interest to enter the logic of the picture, to be in the picture. You're not in the space, but you're in the in the picture. These ones have a tremendous sense of desire to kind of get up close to that model, to be in the space uh, uh, of the model, to not think of the picture as a place of non-space, but in fact as a place of, uh, you know, the image as a site of a kind of inhabitation. So I, I suppose, I don't know, maybe Jeff, you'll have a thought about this. Um, I, when I was looking at these in particular, I, I keep thinking about Burke's definition of the sublime and this moment of looking over a crevice and wanting to jump off, sort of wanting to commit suicide um, in a certain way. And the, it, the conundrum of trying to enter the age of digital non-place is to me like a kind of perpetual state of suicide, just wanting to get in there. There is no way to get in. Uh, but a kind of, um, you know, desire, desire. And I think that the, the Lautner models are, the, the photos of the Lautner models, I think are, for me, they're very, very evocative in, in, that, in that way. And I don't think I would have gotten really to that reading without having gone through, uh, gone through the other ones. And somehow I think that for architecture, this is an, you know, it's an important and interesting issue to think about since if you walk around the school, if you walk to, into the show, Andy, that we were just um, looking at, you know, the, this question of how to inhabit the representation is really uh, basically the haunting device of the, the haunting problematic of the last, of the last 50 years. It's one that haunts the field. It's one that haunts contemporary culture. It's one that haunts contemporary politics. I mean, you can't have all of those demonstrations of resistance without essentially living the media spectacle. Um, so I find that I find that very profound and, and very interesting. Anyway, we're, we're sort of out of time. I don't know if anybody has any um, questions about you know, how to get a job in the model shop, uh, do you call it a model shop, your studio, your process? I don't know how much of you really do know about the process of making these works. They're really interesting. Architecture has a really long relationship to paper um, uh, that I think is important. We can, anybody have anything? It's if fine if you add. don't, you know, don't feel forced. No, it was just for six weeks. Okay. Just six weeks and then we literally, we literally rented the hotel rooms for that project, but it wasn't. I have to say, I tried to stay there while the show was on and there were too many invigilators and they wouldn't let me sleep in the room. <laughs> and I think it would have been probably the most depressing night of my life. Those were deeply miserable little rooms. Um, but sure. it would have been interesting. You know, you have to swing this to a place where it becomes really interesting, where you just look at the most dismissed and you think like, oh, this is really interesting. And if you can get this fascination about the surroundings, you don't have to sleep there then, but like, you know, it's like, you know to get this, get a certain attraction into something which you com would oversee or not appreciate. That's what I thought it would be. Also has to do much with the pictures I showed, you know? That you just look at two buckets kind of being squeezed in a fence, which is really interesting. It's also nothing at the same time. No, I, I guess what I'm saying is a, about the desire that it provokes in the viewer. Mm. So I had, before I got there, I wanted to sleep in one of those hotel rooms. I mean, I just... Because I was really interested in the idea of like extreme criticism. Like you do extreme <laughs> sports, and so extreme criticism would be to go a really long way and go to a hotel thing and actually sleep there and see what that was like. For, so, so that to me was a fantasy that was provoked, and I'm now realizing in retrospect that that was a fantasy to enter the image what I understood to be an image. Like to get to, and, and I, I you know, continue to have this desire to go inside one of the models, 
but in a certain way, like to go in and be too loud or breathe too hard and see if it was going to fall down or somehow that they have this reality testing thing. So it's like, for me, this is all like the Burkean sublime being tempted to jump off the cliff. But I suppose that in the Burkean sense, if you actually jump, then there's no end of the story. I mean, that's it. Maybe it's less interesting if you actually jump. So that's all I meant. Like if you sleep in the hotel room, it's like jumping off the cliff. It's not criticism anymore. It's sleeping in a hotel room. So somehow that distinction is like the drinking of the beer or something. There is a line that is incredibly tantalizing to get very close to, to get your toe across, but somehow it's actually less fun if you cross it. And I'm not, so I would probably sort of recast some of the things have been, that have been said, not in terms of the distinction between art and not art exactly, but about where the pleasure of these things lies. And somehow total engage, total immersion, let's say, for me is less alluring. Mm. I don't know. More than Jeff is looking at me like, wow, this is way more about you than I wanted to know. <laughs> or it's not enough about me. You want to know more. <laughs> well, I can't, I this is not, I'm having difficulty reconciling, sorry, um, your present yourself as a conceptual artist, which I think is correct, and, but then you also speak of wanting the um, photographs to be autonomous. And that's, uh, you seem quite at ease with that relationship. I, don't, I mean, all I, my interest in your work is always about um, the conceptual construction of the work. And without knowing it, I probably wouldn't be interested in the work. I'm not very interested in photography anyway. So, I ha so in your, uh, is there no, no conflict there? Is there no, is it, it just a seamless reconciliation between the fact that they're conceptual works and they're supposed to present themselves as autonomous formal constructions? No, no. Um, I mean, if you go to a museum, any museum, and you go to something which looks, look, seems to be like the most normal, simple, straightforward 16th century portrait of a king, it, in a sense, there is a concept behind it which makes you go to the museum to start with. But also, you know that that painter painted that painting having a face in front of him. You can find out what that face would be. You can find out what the painter, who the painter was. But you don't, can't really say as an artist, if you don't find out, you don't get anything out there. And for me, I can only assume what people see when they see any work, especially my work. So what I'm trying to talk about, like, is th what I'm saying is like, I do think that anything we look at and we can we identify it as, as an artwork, so therefore maybe some, you know, thought process provoking or whatever, has a certain concept. And we just take it for granted in any classic sense because we know so, in and, so well in and out how representation of a face on the oil painting in that size works. But of course the painter needed that face to kind of start with. And in a sense, when, I, when, when you talk about what you kind of identify as the concept in this, is what you know, Holbein would say, I needed I wanted Henry VIII. That's how he looked like, at least I, you know, that's how I saw him or something. And you just kind of, this kind of trace between, this kind of trajectory between the, the, the thing which is being signified and the guy who makes the painting is just, is, is very intact. In my case, obviously you think that this is a problematic kind of, you know, you need to know, otherwise you can't appreciate it. But I think that this, just because, I don't know why, really. I don't, you know, I don't even want to consider too much why, no, no offense, but it's just not, I'm just saying, I'm, I know from all the other art that actually everything comes across as being pretty conceptual if you look at it. It's just, I, I'm not interested in exposure time and in whatever photography thing. That's not my thing. I'm just kind of trying to make things and I'm, I'm trying to draw a line at some point and that's the autonomy of the work. And then I kind of, I, the whole thing becomes more collaborative. But you know, of course, there is conceptual traditions in art, like Absalon, for instance, where you just don't, 
you know, Absalom would never hang a picture of his own in the, in the structure of his own. And you have to draw a line and say, look, this is mine. And even if many of the, I mean, Mutter, without me asking for a, for a cent, she would never kind of, I would never ask her, Mutter, can you do something? And she comes up with a cent. That would be the artist's role. You know, I would say, like, I need exactly this, and it has to smell like this and this, and not like this and this, or something. And then I would try to kind of get her on board, to fight, but because it's just, you know, you just try it out, and then you see whether it's interesting. And, but it's not a perfume, it's not a merchandise or anything. It's that's, it, that's why I said like the collaboration is not with Prada, it's like with Mutual Prada, you know, and that is a big difference and she never would do that otherwise. So, but you know, for me the, especially the, the, the question of where does the, ob where does the object end and where does the, does the, 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 the surrounding starts in which the object has a certain role to play, which is a different one, of course, in a public space than in a museum, that is where the art, that is one th something like I have a thought, and as an artist, I have to find a form, form for it. That's what I. That's what my task is, and so somehow I find this a really important kind of. One of the things I really need to make clear is where, where does the end, the, the artwork end? Can I just elaborate? Um, I, I know the work is. I know the work is really different, um, but when I let, let me ask you to think about your work in relationship to someone like Wally Beshti. Mm. Um, I understand that his work is highly indexical of the events that produce the work, um, and yours is less so. But without knowing those events whatsoever, uh, the work becomes unbelievably obscure. Uh, yours doesn't become obscure, but knowing the events that surround the work uh, utterly reforms it, which is why whenever you read criticism of your work, it's all about that. Mm. I've never once read a single work of criticism on your work that treats the, uh, the photograph as such. And so there, the issue of the narrative and the meta-narrative and the constructed context, it seems fundamental, even though you both hang your work without ever putting that up. No title or, I mean, mm. so you, you share the idea of an absolute, mis, uh, or a, let's say a f liberation of it from that, but at the same time, it seems essential to the work, and that's why I was reinforcing the idea mm. that it's not photography, it's conceptual work of a, of a mm. different kind of order. I think, you know, like you're saying that, I mean, we have a lot in common, but we also we have something where we just com com we fundamentally disagree, or like have a different idea of what the picture would be or the work would be. And that is, he's kind of working with, an, with a notion of abstraction which has been formed in, in painting. Mm -hmm. And I do believe strongly that if I use photography, that is, like a like an agreement, you know. Everybody knows how photography works. Everybody has a camera in his pocket right now and knows how it kind of works. And to kind of refuse the indexicality of that process is just seems like to the say the least eccentric, you know. And I think in a sense even those Lautner photographs are extremely abstract. They kind of too abstract to a point, but they don't lose their reference, you know. And I think that if then I should just start, start painting. If I don't want that agreement then I just paint you know or like I like Wolfgang does it Wolfgang Tillmans does it with a, I put chemicals on the paper that's a different state of the work but for me the pho photograph is this agreement that you know how it's made and I know how it's made and a technological um, you know device whatever that would be whether it's an analog camera or whatever has been the performer for that agreement somehow but it doesn't matter what camera it is it doesn't matter what process it is that's the agreement we have like how we look at things and that's No, no, no. It's just what what all I did was like I took the the, the Coca Cola mirror with me when I went back to Europe, and I made exactly the same frame, everything, and instead of the Coca Cola mirror because I thought they can they can miss that for so six the weeks. Oh, I see. Well, it's a scan of a book, and it's a double page book. Okay. Sorry. But, but that's why the index the, 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 the question, I mean, the question about the work is that it raises the question, what is it indexing, right? So most of the criticism describes, in fact, not what it's actually indexing, which is the paper model, but what the paper model is itself an image of, right? So it enters this 
it, it, and it really sort of interrupts the flow of the self-evidentiary nature of the photograph. Well, when you started, I thought you started to refer to Robin. I thought you were going to go to the index of photography. No, I know. Well, we, we might have, but, but then he said, you know, it's not a theory, he's an artist, so I decided maybe that that was better, that was, that was better not a direction to go to. I thought I didn't want to start off by pissing him off. I would kind of save that maybe right for the end. I, I think that that's a better gift at the end of a presentation um, rather than a, at the beginning, but I tried not to do that too. Um, the, you know, just as a really last point of conclusion, maybe because Jeff is here and you all are, you know, thesis is always on the mind and how to present things and, and so forth. One of, and your question about the dailies, um, you know, another figure that one could, question about photography and conceptual art and so forth, who lurks in the back of all of this is somebody like Ed Rouché. And to think about the role of the photograph and thinking about architecture and urbanism and, you know, I, th I think one could make an interesting set of discussions about the relationship between your work and Ed Rouché's work and the way both were absorbed into architecture um, in, in certain ways. Um, we, we could add to that that Rouché didn't just make photographs, he made books. And he invented a new form of a gallery space, essentially, in the art book with photographs in it. And um, so in the contemporary context, as people are making books again and making magazines again and so forth, I think it would be interesting to think about the architecture of these books and how they move through the world and what their, what their postal system is and what you do with them. And so the, the last thing I would just say as a, as a point of information, that the one place where sort of most of the pieces of the dailies stay together is in an artist book that you made. And the artist book that it unfolds and essentially makes a model of the building more or less by turning itself inside out. So the book itself, which is, this is, would be a really radical distinction from any of Rouché's books, the book itself exists in more than one form, somewhere between a collection of images and a physical object, somewhere between a model and a concept, et cetera. So I think it's exactly this line between concept and object that is, that is super fascinating. But you might think, as an added thing, I know that you have a lot of things to think about when you present your projects. But one might also think about the packaging of the way that you present your projects as yet another moment in which the project lives on and disseminates and finds new audiences and finds new ways of affecting the world um, that receives it. So with that, we're, everybody's tired. And thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much for, for staying with me. Thank you.